sackings, substances, and of course that interminable feud which left many of us asking which one really is pink. Welcome Classic Rock Pants to a video where we grasp the nettle of interband politics. The dark side of the Floyd, so to speak. Interestingly, the things only heated up recently with Polly Sampson describing Roger Waters as a lip-syncing, Putin-supporting, sick-with-envy megalomaniac. But this, of course, is just the tip of a very large iceberg as both camps exchange insults. Uh, interestingly, Russo said that... Uh, Insults are the arguments employed by those who are in the wrong. But despite these venerable old gentlemen, as Nick Mason calls them, boiling away in their own piss, it has to be said that the sackings, intimidation and substances, has to be said, has been very much, uh, very much part and parcel of the history of this band. Even Waters uh, said that uh, at times he felt bullied and belittled by Gilmore and Wright leaving Nick Mason totally flabbergasted. A bit like Al Capone complaining of bloodstains on his tux, no doubt. And a bit of foreshadowing before this band were even called Pink Floyd. Keith Noble and Clive Metcalf left after they felt their ideas did not suit the new direction that this band were going in. Incidentally, they went on to write Summer Song by Chad and Jeremy. Interesting though, uh, Clive Metcalf has said that he found Waters to be intimidating and authoritative. Behaviour Waters has said that was due to his uh, youth and his insecurity. I read somewhere that a certain engineer, I think it was Brian Humphreys on the Animals album, I could be wrong there though, said that he often had to keep his politics to himself because he feared being mauled by Waters and his leftist rants. But in terms of uh, personnel in this band, we can go all the way back to the Sid years, which is a story of, uh, a well-thoroughed story of catastrophic mental decline amid the amoeba blobs and light show of the band's earliest performances and many of the band went on to feel very guilty about the how they handled the whole Sid affair. Interestingly speaking of Sid's decline, um, the band were playing the Cheetah Club. I think they were put on the bill with the Alice Cooper group. Now Dennis Dunaway in his book states, I sat down in the kitchen and started talking to Sid Barrett. I'd heard he was the founder of the group. He seemed to be interested in what I was saying but when I asked him a question he didn't respond. His gaze was fixed. Thinking he was stoned, I went to check out his guitar. It was propped up in the corner with no case. And when I saw the rusty strings and the twisted neck, I sensed that something was wrong. Of course, it got to the point where Barrett just couldn't perform. Lost amid this ocean of detuning and this catatonic stare. All amid the blobs and bubbles of the early stages. This all left the band in a bit of a quandary, as you can imagine. Of course, it was suggested that he should be like a Brian Wilson figure to regale the band with material from the wings while they draft in Dave Gilmer to do the on-stage stuff. Apparently, Sid Barrett did not make life easy for Gilmore. In fact, he got very uncomfortable, in fact. Things got worse, of course, and eventually Sid was sacked. It wasn't sacked, really. He was kind of abandoned, left on the roadside like a lost puppy while the band headed off to Southampton to their gig. Nick Mason writes in his autobiography, in the car on the way to collect Sid, someone said, shall we pick up Sid? And the response was, no, fuck it, let's not bother. To recount it as badly as that sounds hard-hearted to the point of being cruel, but it's true. The decision was, and we were, completely callous. Apparently Sid would occasionally turn up at gigs fronted by Gilmore and he'd stand at the front and just stare up at him which must have been unnerving to say the least. Of course Richard Wright insists that Sid fried his brain on acid whereas Roger Waters points to maybe underlying schizophrenic tendencies uh, to pinpoint Sid's decline or signpost Sid's decline perhaps. But nevertheless Sid would continue to haunt this band for the rest of their career before eventually emerging as that brilliant and dazzling metaphor of the Crazy Diamond in 1975. According to Waters, the band ended with Dark Side of the Moon, really. And I think Gilmore has said something very similar in the fact that this band had no longer any creative impetus once it achieved that level of superstardom. They'd kind of drifted and meandered. 
Walter's response to this was become a bit of a workaholic, I think, where the rest of the band were just lost amid a, a kind of an indifferent funk or indecisive funk, maybe. But this disenchantment with fame and success was explored on Wish You Were Here with a critique of the, the music industry, as well as a, in part a tribute to their, their fallen bandmate, who's very much apparent in those mournful chimes of Crazy Diamond. By 77, of course, the band had converged at the newly built Britannia Row Studios uh, to make what Nick Mason describes as their roughest album. Although he does say that the atmosphere during Animals was actually lighter than during Wish You Were Here. Nevertheless, Waters describes the studios as feeling like a prison. But interestingly, we spoke about uh, Sid's decline, maybe due to uh, excessive LSD use, who knows, but uh, another substance had begun to rear its head. A lot of accounts, a lot of unofficial accounts, by the way, have stated that uh, Richard Wright developed a serious coke habit about this time and up through the, the animals period in the wall. Even Gilmore was uh, apparently had a problem as well, that's what I've read, suggesting that there was quite a lot of snorting going on during the animals album. But nevertheless, of course, this would impact upon one's ability to contribute creatively, I suspect. And Richard Wright was perceived as being a bit of a passenger, fueling, I think, Waters' megalomaniac tendencies. Nick Mason has said one of the problems is that Roger Waters just doesn't respect Gilmore. He respects writing, he respects lyrics and words, which, of course, further led to the schism, I think. But certainly during the Animals, LP, the band's angriest of albums. Many have said that's uh, kind of their punk album. And even Mark Blake writing uh, in Classic Rock makes a similar point, stating, filled with self-lacerating attacks on capitalism and financial gluttony, animals channeled as much righteous anger as any punk album. When it came to the wall, this band had ceased to be a democracy, with Waters, I think, not really consulting his bandmates in terms of the writing or whether they have any ideas. Arrogant or resigned, you decide. There's a famous quote by Winston Churchill. The best argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. Maybe there was a bit of that going on. Certainly any semblance of banned democracy crumbled with the wall, with uh, Waters virtually ignoring, I think, Gilmore's attempts to submit material or attempt to write or contribute anything. Interesting, during the wall sessions, Richard Wright was asked to curtail his holidays which he refused to do, further pissing off Waters, who insisted on uh, Richard Wright being sacked or he would pull the project. Um, so he was uh, effectively sacked from Pink Floyd and would then just be paid as a kind of a jobbing musician, a, a session musician, and certainly as a touring musician with The Wall. Actually, Richard Wright went on to make more money than the rest of the band when he toured with this production, as it was so expensive the rest of them had to foot the bill, but he didn't. He just got paid as a, as I said, a touring musician. In terms of the treatment of Richard Wright, uh, Nick Mason has said, uh, such craven compliance might have been the result of gradual changes wrought in the band's structure over the previous decade. Perhaps lacking confidence in his own writing abilities, David may have felt that if we'd confronted these issues, we risked losing Roger and being unable to continue. Or in the aftermath of Rick's departure, maybe we feared being marginalised and then negotiated out individually. Gives you some idea of what the atmosphere in that band must have been like at this time. Of course, Waters would announce his own departure, citing his leaving member clause in his contract uh, so that the, there could be a focus on his solo material rather than Pink Floyd. And feeling that he was the main creative force in the band, he felt that the Pink Floyd just could not continue without him. They were a spent force. In October 86, Water started High Court proceedings to formally dissolve Pink Floyd. Water's insistence that the, this band could not continue without him or could not do it further infuriated Gilmore, who strikes me as a bit of a stubborn bugger, to be honest with you. An out-of-court settlement was eventually released on Christmas Eve 1987. The agreement meant Waters was freed from his contract with... Uh, Floyd's management and Mason and Gilmore were allowed to trade under the Pink Floyd name. When Waters broached the topic of Pink Floyd or the identity of the band, I think his legal team or Floyd's legal team said, look, this is a label. It has commercial value. You can't say that this is no longer going to exist. Momentary lapse of reason has been described by Waters as a clever forgery. And he wasn't that uh, complimentary about the division bell either. 
But certainly that album is an album that lacks a conceptual bite, shall we say. It lacks, well, it lacks waters, doesn't it? Um, and it's not even, uh, most people acknowledge that it's not really a Pink Floyd album. It's Mason hardly plays anything on it, and nor does Richard Wright. Mason attributes this to the, them not having any confidence, I think, after the, uh, after the Waters years, perhaps. David Gilmore said it was the tour that brought these guys back into being functioning musicians. And things weren't going particularly well for Roger Waters. He was playing moderate arenas on his Radio Chaos tour, while his former band were playing huge stadiums, uh, down the road, I think Roger Waters has said that I'm, yeah, I'm competing with myself and losing. And of course, Live Eight, we get that reunion with Live Eight, and things looked a bit prickly on stage, certainly in the body language between Gilmore and Waters. But nevertheless, they were on that stage together, and I, like a lot of people, felt that it might lead to a reunion or a tour. I know Waters has said he would like to like there to have been more of it, but Gilmore was adamant that uh, it was a one-off. In fact, it stated that the band were offered 150 million to reform and tour, which they turned down. Makes you wonder that that level of cash is insufficient to get Gilmore on the road with Waters once more. And this epic power struggle, of course, uh, snorted and bleated its way into life once more over the Animals reissue, which as a fan, like many of you, I suspect, found, I found incredibly disappointing. But the argument wasn't over James Guthrie's mix, more Mark Blake's liner notes, who uh, Waters feels that uh, Gilmore's problem with those notes is it gave Waters far too much credit for the, for the achievement or the writing of, of that album. Mason has said that it's just disappointing to see these uh, rather elderly gentlemen still at loggerheads. And the latest twist, of course, is uh, the reworking, Waters' reworking of Dark Side of the Moon. And in further twist, of course, Pink Floyd have decided to reissue from their 50th anniversary Dark Side of the Moon box set the standalone version of the remix of that album at the same time as Waters puts out his uh, Dark Side of the Moon redux. I think it's fair to say that these two gentlemen are not on each other's Christmas card list. Anyway, you've been watching a video by Classic Album Review. If you enjoyed this video, please do click like, subscribe, and check that notification bell. It makes all the difference. And share this video if you can. Other than that, I'll leave you with my closing salvo, which is hope you're well, staying healthy, but more importantly, that you keep listening.